Hi everybody, welcome to Houston, Texas. We're here at John Mooring's Memorial Service. We're gonna get started here in just a few minutes, but we thought it would be a good idea to show you a little bit of the memorabilia that's here. Um, big thank you to Scott Wells behind the iPad here, who's making sure that you all can see this. Really appreciate that, Scott. The first thing we wanted to show you is this an absolutely spectacular floral arrangement, which was sent by John's good friend, Lance Burton. So Lance, if you're watching, even if you're not, thank you very much, very generous, and uh, much appreciated. Now we're going to take you over to a table that John's family set up. Scott Martin. Uh oh, look out, there's Scott Wells. Yeah, we're on film. So here are some of the things the family has set up to, to show our attendees. Uh, memorabilia from John's life. Some family pictures over here. Of course, right in front are John's three great books, The Texan Trickster, which is getting pretty hard to find. Uh, the Magical Life of Marshall Brodeen, a great biography of Marshall. And then, of course, The Del Rey book, Del Rey book right. yeah, which is absolutely terrific. This, uh, if you can get in on this picture right here, David cool. Ray Yell and his son just painted this and brought that to be here at the... Uh, at the ceremony and then to gift it to Jeannie and Frank. Absolutely. That's Jeannie and Frank's picture? Is that the These are family pictures. Uh, John's father, yeah. Go ahead, Charles. You uh, it's, uh, it's father and mother. And this, of course, is John's son, Charles. Uh, we'll get him on Charles. Camera. And John's sister, Jeannie. Jeannie. Uh, there we go. And then along the back here are some of John's awards uh, when he was competing before he did the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, and then most recently, the Houston Magicians honored John with this great Lifetime Achievement Award. And that was done right here in the Union Hall about a year and a half ago. So great to see that here. Of course, Magic Magazine, thanks to Gary Plants, uh, did a terrific cover story about John. And uh, uh, just a wonderful article written by Gary and a great cover. And fortunately, John got to see this and enjoy it uh, while he was still with us. Then over here, we've got a photo album which has some terrific photos from John's career. I'll just flip through here, Scott. This one's a little strange when he's doing theme parks. Looks like a space space invader, but some really great pictures. He used to do Astro World, didn't he? I, I that's it, yeah. exactly right, yeah. But some great photos here from John's career. I wish we had time to show them all to you, but you can get a sense here of John's performing days. Just show you a few more here. There he is doing the Vanishing Bird Cage for some scouts. Very cool. Um, there he is doing the act uh, that he did on the Ed Sullivan Show. And then, of course, if you pan up here, Scott, we've got the wonderful poster that Norm Lupe Nielsen created, which has some great photos of John throughout his career. Uh, so just a great celebration. We've got a great turnout, and we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. So stay tuned here on Facebook, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming and joining us at this great event. Thank you, Mark. All right. Hey, David. And so, so David that? Rangel, yeah, we're looking at the picture over there that you had, uh, oh, yeah. you and your son had painted, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Very cool. Very nice. A lot of color. Charlie Dodson, uh, Trixie's father, happy 90th birthday then to you also. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Very much. So many people uh, over here then uh, today. Uh, Dexter Cleveland, actually a lot of people. Uh, Alan Howard has uh, come over uh, then as well. Uh, here's Alan, the new editor for MUM. And we're going to get ready here shortly. Trixie and uh, Gary Plants. Hey, Jacob. Good job on that painting, by the way. Very good job. <laughs> Frank Price over there. Okay, we're going to uh, see if we can get ready over here for just a minute to get this uh, everybody squared away. Yeah, just a minute. We're going to have everybody to. Uh, yeah. Probably using the microphone. Use the microphone. Hey there, Kurt. Sue? Yeah. 
Jamie and Kurt, Lisa, Scotto, <laughs> Marty. Flashlight with a magnet on it. Oh man, I could use that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, no? I'll let you see a little bit of the um, slide presentation while we're waiting over here. Oh, yes, of course. Hey, no. Noah, thank you for watching. It means a lot. Um, I hope you enjoy the service. Yeah, thank Thanks, you for Charles. tuning in. So how old are you? I'm 23. 23. And yeah, my friend from Las Vegas is watching right now. Are you from Las Vegas? You came yeah. up this, this Well, region? I live in Cincinnati now. Okay, did you go to school at UNLV or? No, I went to school in Colorado. Okay. Yeah. And CU or whereabouts? Colorado State University, State. Okay. yeah. And you're in where, Seattle, you say now? I'm in Cincinnati, Cincinnati now. Cincinnati, Yeah, okay. Ohio. Yeah. So thank Great. you to my friend from Vegas. Um, I grew up with him and we went to high school together. So thank you for watching this, Noah. Any memories you want to quickly say about your father before? Oh, my father was just a legend. Um, I, he was always a great entertainer. He, he was a funny guy. And um, later he became a writer. And he was just a really big inspiration to me growing up. So yeah. my father was a great man. You'll see more about him as Good. the service goes. Thank you. Thank you for live streaming this. You're welcome. It's great. I see everybody's taking their seats over here. Let me get this uh, thing uh, ready over here. some of your Saturday with us. As we have said on Facebook and other places, this is intended to be a celebration of John's life, so we really appreciate you being here to help us celebrate. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I think we all know John, but just a few words about him. He was a magician, a producer, a director, a creator, an author, an editor, and a collector. He was a father, a family man, and a devoted friend. In the end, he was strong and brave in the face of a cruel disease that slowly and progressively robbed him of the things he enjoyed most. But I think we all recognize that he never lost his intellect, his humor, and his curiosity, and it was a wonderful thing to see. Of course, most of you know that we had to reschedule this event because of Hurricane Harvey. We appreciate your patience, but I promise you, especially those of you from out of town, you would not have wanted to be here that weekend. <laughs> of course, since that time, we've endured Hurricane Irma, devastating Florida and Puerto Rico, terrible devastation in Mexico and in California, and of course, the tragedy in John's former home of Las Vegas. So I'd like to propose we just take a brief moment of silence to recognize those who've lost so much over the last couple of weeks. You might be wondering about this venue. Houston magicians, of course, know it well. John wasn't overly religious, so we didn't think a church would be the right place to have this celebration. It seemed to us that this place was perfect. It's sort of backstage, and that's where John was happiest and most comfortable. As, as you probably know, this is the union hall for our local stagehands union, and we want to thank Jeff Lanes and his brethren for making this facility available. <laughs> Back on the table is an award that John received from Houston Magicians right in this room about a year ago, I think it was, Jeff. And this place has such deep connections with the theater that we thought it was just the perfect venue to hold this event. Um, 
By way of introductions, my name is Mark Holstein, and my only qualification for standing up here is that John was a friend of mine, as he was a friend to all of you. And I'm really honored that the family asked me to, to host the celebration. I want to introduce a few people before we go any further. Of course, John's devoted and dedicated family, his sister Jeannie and his brother-in-law Frank, they're sitting right up front here. Uh, his son Charles is here with us. If you haven't met Charles, be sure you have a chance to say hello to him. And Charles's mom, Cindy, is here as well. And we thank you all for being here. I thought it was worth spending a few minutes telling you about John Mooring. Now, you all know the story, but it's a great story, and it's one that I think is worth retelling. John was born right here in Houston on July 9, 1942. In 1951, his family moved to Rockdale, and early on, John caught the magic bug, like so many others in the room did. In the traditional way, he got uh, magic tricks and visited the local library and picked up books and went to the local magic shop. And like so many of us, his interest was fueled. 1950s were a very unique time if you were coming up in magic. For sure, vaudeville was dead. But it still existed in one form, and that was a television show in the 1950s called The Ed Sullivan Show. Many of us, uh, those of us with gray hair at least, remember The Ed Sullivan Show. Sullivan presented some of the great talents of the time, but he particularly loved variety acts. And so every week, the show featured variety acts. And John was right there at home watching with the rest of us as some of his heroes, people like Fantasio, Ricciardi, Fred Capps, Jay Marshall, Channing Pollock, appeared on the show. <laughs> John watched them all and learned. And as he watched, he developed a plan. He was going to be on that show. Uh, from that moment on, he was singularly focused on appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show. Well, he didn't just wait for it to happen, he went to work. And he developed an act, which magicians in the room will know, was an incredibly technical, challenging, and difficult magic act. And he worked and worked and worked until he perfected it. It was a showcase of some of the most difficult sleight of hand. It didn't hurt that he had movie star good looks and charisma and could present the magic well, <coughs> he did. At age 16, he traveled to Chicago, and he competed in an international competition. It was a convention put on by the IBM, the International Brotherhood of Magicians, and the Society of American Magicians. He didn't win, but he came back fired up and committed to continuing to develop the act. He competed here in Texas very often at a convention called the Texas Association of Magicians, uh, and won some trophies. There are a few on the table back there. But in 1964, lightning struck for John. He met a man named Mark Letty. And if you don't know, Mark Letty was the booker, the talent booker for the Ed Sullivan Show, and was responsible back in the day for the careers of some really great magicians. He saw John performing here in Texas at the State Fair, uh, I'm sorry, at the New York State Fair at the Texas Pavilion, and he liked what he saw. He told John that he wanted him to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show. This is what John had been working for up to that point. Uh, Letty knew a good magician if he saw one. He started booking John on cruise ships and nightclubs so that John could continue to develop and hone his act. Uh, and Letty kept him very busy. So this was a great time for John. And then in, light, in 1966, it all came together. On April 24th, 1966, John got to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show. And Jeff, if you're ready, let's go ahead and show that video. Girls, come on there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the young John and Mary.
by the way, for the non-magicians in the room, and I know there's some of you here, that stuff is really hard. Uh, and to see it now, almost 56 years later, and recognize it's still relevant and it's still as beautiful as it was when he did it that night, uh, really impressive to watch. You'd never know it by watching that clip, but the appearance was completely nerve-wracking. At the last minute, in order to make room for some other talent, the directors asked John to shorten the act by quite a bit. And magicians will appreciate how hard that is to do on the fly. But John did it, and it was completely flawless and smooth and beautiful, and a lasting testament to the great magic that John performed. I'm glad we had a chance to see it today. I think it's fair to say that you could divide John's professional life into B tests and A tests. Tess, of course, is the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, and the appearance on the show opened the door to prestigious bookings from all, from all over the world. John had the chance to travel and perform in, in, in some of the most prestigious venues. But as John Rockerbaumer recently noted in a Genie uh, obituary, John wanted to do something more permanent and lasting. And so at some point after, after the Ed Sullivan show, he decided to branch out and do other things. John became one of the leading producers of magic in the world. He produced shows in, in nightclubs, in amusement parks. He did one right here at Astroworld, if you didn't know that. Uh, and it really became one of the leading producers of magic shows and theatrical productions around the world. He also became a technical advisor. Some great magicians relied on John to improve their shows, to come up with ideas, and to provide technical advice. And John continued that work, really, right up until the end of his life, uh, and uh, really was in demand. One of the most, in my opinion, one of the most exciting shows that John did was a show called The Wizard's Secrets in Las Vegas. How many of you saw that show? Okay, quite a few of you. You'll remember it was a really remarkable venue right at the entrance of the MGM Theater, for those of you that didn't see it. It was an old kind of steampunk Victorian theater, and over the course of several years, hundreds of thousands of people saw that show. Uh, they, the show ran six or eight times a day. I think it was eight times a day in the beginning, and then, and then less. It became one of the most successful attractions in magic history, probably seen by more people than most any other show in, in the history of magic. Really remarkable. While John was in, in Las Vegas, of course, he became an associate editor and then later an editor of Magic Magazine, which is, I think it fair to say, or was, one of the most prestigious magazines in the magic world. Uh, and I would say, at least, that the, mag the magazine was never better than when John was at the helm. It was an absolutely terrific world-class magazine. John left there and became the editor-in-chief of the MUM magazine, which is a house magazine of the Society of American Magicians. And uh, I would say he took what was then a tired, old, and fairly irrelevant magazine and made it one of the leading magazines in our craft again. And it is today, and in fact, the new editor of the magazine, Alan Howard, is here today. So, Alan, thanks for coming, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, you continuing the great work that John started. You all know that John was a celebrated author. Uh, and in fact, three books that he wrote are on the table in the back if you haven't had a chance to look at them. Uh, the most sought after of those books is The Texan Trickster. And it's a book that he wrote which revealed some secrets to other magicians. You can't find that book anymore. It's, it's quite a collector's item now. But it's a great, great book and held in high esteem by great magicians. In fact. If you didn't notice the floral display when you came in, that floral display was sent by John's great friend, Lance Burton. And Lance always said that The Texan Trickster was one of his prized books and uh, uh, really sought after. John also wrote two wonderful biographies, which are on the table back there if you haven't seen them. One about uh, Chicago magician and entrepreneur Marshall Brodine, uh, absolutely terrific book and one uh, about a really enigmatic performer by the name of Del Rey. Magicians will know Del Rey, but uh, a very quirky and unusual man, and John really managed to, to lay out on the page what Del Rey was all about. Those books are sought after not just by magicians, but by the general public as well, and if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them both. They're great books. He also served as the editor for Bill Spooner's Journal of Magic Research. John was passionate about the history of magic, uh, I'd say he knew as much about the history of magic as just about anybody I knew uh, and had the ability to put it on the page in a way that was fun to read and interesting and exciting. And of course, he was a great editor. In 2014, John was honored at the Super Session in Dallas in 2014. Uh, if you have a chance to look at uh, the slideshow, there's some pictures from that event as a real highlight for John. And that event featured 
a video called It's All About Tess that Gary Plants, where's Gary? I know he's here, there he is, put together specifically for that event. And it's on John's website, and if you haven't seen it, it's an absolutely wonderful thing to take a look at. So thank you to Gary for that. In April of 2016, family and friends gathered here in Houston to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the appearance you just watched on The Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, it was a wonderful celebration, and I know many of you were there. Uh, it was really a highlight for John to be able to look at back at this and to celebrate such a remarkable achievement. That's John as a magician, a producer, and an author. But he was so much more than that. John was a father. It was the thing I'd say he was the most proud of. He would light up whenever he spoke about Charles, and it was often he talked about Charles all the time. Uh, he was insanely proud of Charles and his accomplishments, and he loved him to his core. He was a family man. Uh, you all know how close he was to family, and specifically to Jeannie and Frank. Uh, you know, the last couple of years of his life, he relied so thoroughly and heavily on Jeannie and Frank, and they were always there. Uh, and it's just remarkable uh, what great family <coughs> had. Most, most notably, though, I think, I would say the word that describes John Waring the best is friend. And I think everybody in this room knows that. Recently, I spoke to Mike Cavity. Magicians will recognize the name, a great magician out in California. And he said something that I thought mm -hmm. summed up John in a single sentence. He said, you know, I've never heard a single negative story about John Waring. And, you know, I think that's right. I think as I've had a chance to talk to friends around, around the magic world since July, no one had anything but positive things to say about John. And isn't that a remarkable legacy? John was humble. He was self-effacing. At times, very stubborn. We all knew that. Uh, <laughs> quiet and reserved. But he was always, to his core, a true and loyal friend. Everyone who knew him loved him, and there were many. John was smart, and he had a ninja-like sense of humor. With an efficiency of words, he could describe a show, a book, a song, or almost anything else accurately and completely honestly. He offered praise freely and gave targeted criticism. If you listened carefully when John spoke, and he didn't talk a lot, you learned. Uh, and that's what I appreciated about him as a friend. I had a chance to write a couple of articles for him when he was at the helm of Magic Magazine, and I experienced this firsthand. He never micromanaged, but with just a few words of praise and at times criticism, he would take something that was passively good and make it absolutely exceptional. That was John. After achieving his goal of appearing on this Ed Sullivan show, I think it's fair to say that John eventually stepped out of the spotlight. Although he did revive that act on its 25th anniversary for a, a national magic convention. And it was a show, it was all Ed Sullivan performers. And watching that then, 25 years later, as I said before, the act was still completely relevant, beautiful, and magicians loved it. Um, after that, he retired the act. He never did it again. I think, personally, I think John liked staying in the background. He could use his skills, his intelligence, and his wisdom to tell stories, to direct people, and to inspire his friends, and make the magic world around him a little better place. John leaves a gaping hole in our community, but his legacy is intact with the friendships he made, with his writings, and, of course, that incredible performance on The Ed Sullivan Show. You've heard enough from me. There are many here who knew John longer and even better than I. If you have a remembrance that you'd like to share or you want to say something about John, we would welcome that now. I'll start. Frank. Well, I got to know John back uh, when we were kids. Used to, uh, my grandmother lived a few blocks from uh, where John and Jeannie lived, and we'd walk by there in the summertime and John was always out in the corner, and there were always 15, 20 kids standing around because he had built some new illusion or something, and he was doing a magic show. And we were all fascinated with the stuff he did. And it was amazing because he was in talent shows in Rockdale and, and that kind of thing. And, and we kind of figured, well, maybe John's going to become a magician one day. And as you all know, he very well did. So, but I, I think that uh, when I, we were in high school, John was a couple of years ahead of us, and he used to do the black and white printing for the annual and the, new, and the newspaper. And he was around one day, and I, I always had an interest in photography. So uh, John said to me one day, he said, he knew me, he said, 
I see you with a camera a lot. Would you like to, because I'm graduating this year, would you like to learn to operate the darkroom? So he taught me how to operate the black and white darkroom, of which something I've carried with me ever since then. I don't still do black and white darkroom, but I still do a lot of photography. And a lot of that I owe to John and his inspiration that he gave me to continue with that. But I got to tell you a, a story that I thought was that it, it, Mark made the point a while ago that one thing John never lost due to his Parkinson's was his sense of humor. And I used to take John to the grocery store. Well, for a while he would push a basket around and I'd walk in front of him because he had a little trouble looking up and, and I'd walk in front of him and when I would stop, he would stop. But one day we go to uh, Kroger and we're in there and he decided he wanted to drive the little electric car. <laughs> and I went, okay. I wasn't too sure how that was going to come out. Well, about 10 minutes later, I said, John, I've got to go to the bathroom. Stay right here. Sure. Mark also mentioned the fact that John could be a little stubborn. <laughs> well, he didn't exactly stay right there. I came out and I went, oh, no, where is John? And the place was busy. So I'm running up down the aisles, up and down the aisles looking for John. All of a sudden, I hear this. <laughs> and I realized that someone had collided with a large... Uh, display of canned goods, and so I thought, found him. <laughs> so I went around the corner, and there's John sitting there. He's just grinning from ear to ear, looking at me, going, "John Morey makes another fantastic." <laughs> <laughs> Manager came over. He was more concerned because John's got cans all over the place, and he said, "Are you okay, sir?" He said, "Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine." But John Morey was a, a great guy, and the last four years got to know him really better than well. And loved him dearly, and we'll miss him. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Anyone else want to share a thought or a memory about John? Well, I'm going to read a note I received uh, from someone most of you will know, Ramon Galindo. And he, his note was, I'd like to say that we lost a great friend and a magician who I had the honor of working with at the beginning of his long career. I'm very saddened on the loss of John. I remember making clothes for him with all the hidden pockets. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> and also made him the vanishing birdcage. May he rest in peace and God bless him and his family. At 96, I wish I could travel to attend, but I'll be thinking of him on October 14th during the ceremony, Ramon Galindo. And then Scott, I think you have a memory to share. I do. This was uh, something that uh, A.J. LaHaye had sent to me, and many of you uh, from Houston uh, no AJ. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you know that his more famous person is a member of the Red Shoe Club, the uh, clown that's a hamburger place. Anyhow, that he has uh, was unable to make it today, uh, but had sent something that he had posted on Facebook. And after he had heard about uh, John's passing, and then Jamie had suggested that uh, he perhaps read the text here. So he planned on being here, but uh, regrettably that he can't. So he'd asked me that if I read this. He says, at 15 years old, I was looking for a way to make some money that was more fun and didn't leave me permeated with the smell of garlic and, uh, from the pizza place where I was working. <laughs> I took mental stock of what skills I had, and all I came up with was the ability to ride a unicycle. But the question was, how could that be turned into money without joining the circus? Well, it was 1969, and the new Astroworld theme park was in its second season, so a group of friends and I visited for the first time. There, we ran into some costume animal characters interacting with the crowds. Suddenly, a light went off in my head, surely lit by angels. Maybe I could be a costume character riding a unicycle. That had to pay more than slinging pizza sauce in the pizza place where I work, and that would sure be a lot more fun. Soon, I was able to get an interview with Astroworld's then director of live shows. He liked my idea and took me to where those animal characters I had seen got dressed to see if I could actually ride the unicycle while wearing a 40-pound wolf costume head. <laughs> I could, so he hired me. This is the man who gave me my first job in entertainment. He started me on the most fun and fascinating career that has lasted my whole life to now. God only knows what I'd be doing today if not for him. Isn't it so totally profound that one small event can change everything in a life? I didn't know that at the time that he was a magician too, which explained how he was able to magically appear at the door of our dressing room to check in on us and to disappear just as quickly and quietly. <laughs> it turned out later that among his many other grand accomplishments, he became a renowned authority on magic, an author and editor of magic books, and even the editor of Magic Magazine. I ran into him a few times at magic conventions and felt very fortunate to have had the opportunity to thank him a few times over the years for the wonderful adventure he started me upon. 
Today, I found out that he passed away in July. It was too early at the age of only 74 from a fight with that nasty Parkinson's disease, which no magic can yet defeat. At the time of his writing, he said, I'll be attending a memorial and the broken wand ceremony, which is a magician thing, to honor him in a couple of weeks. His name is John Moore. He was, is, and will always be my hero. May he truly rest in peace and maybe get to meet Houdini. So that from A.J. LaHaye. about 18 years, which of course I wish to have known him earlier and later. I wish there was more than that 18 years there. I uh, first met him when I moved to Las Vegas and started working for Magic Magazine and got to know him in the office and then outside the office. And unlike some other people I know, he got more interesting the more you know him. I'm not saying anything dirty, I'm being bleeped. <laughs> I try to keep it clean. So yeah, the more you knew him, the more you got to realize there's a lot more to this guy because he's not the most forthcoming. He had a fascinating life, a lot of great stories but he was not one to brag about it. Uh, but once he found out, he thought, wow, this is great. Um, our friend Charlie Fry, who would be here, except he's in New Zealand right now, pointed out that while John was making a career of entertainment magic, he still had the enthusiasm of an amateur, so he carried that with him all the time, always enthusiastic about learning something new and sharing it with other people, whether it's uh, hanging out with friends, or putting in his writing, or doing a show. He's always coming up with something to be entertaining <coughs> and informative and inspire us. And I don't know if he actually consciously set out to inspire us, but that's what happened. Uh, when John decided to retire from being MUM editor, he suggested to me that I might want to take over that spot, which didn't sound right to me at the time, but apparently I changed my mind. And the last time I talked to John, I was able to tell him, hey, I've applied for this magazine job, and it looks like you might get it. So he was happy to hear about that, and I said, if I get this, I'm gonna hit you up for advice and ideas, and he didn't seem unhappy to hear about that. So now, I'm sorry he's not around, I can do that, but uh, for all of us who've been inspired and learned a lot from him, and we're just going to miss having you around and hope that we can live up to the, the faith that he had in us. Thanks. Anyone else? <coughs> well, thank you all for sharing your thoughts. And, and again, thank you for being here. Thank you to our friends on Facebook. As you may know, we're streaming this live. Uh, thanks to Scott Wells for making that happen. Really appreciate it. As magicians, we have a tradition at the end of a fellow magician's life. It honors the life of the magician through the symbolism and power of the magic wand. Today, representing the great organizations of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Society of American Magicians, we have two close friends of John's who are going to perform this very special ceremony, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about it as they do the ritual. So please welcome Jeff Lanes, Regional Vice President of the Society of American Magicians, and Scott Wells, Territorial Vice President of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Gentlemen. There is no death. What seems so is transition. This life of mortal breath is but a suburb of the life Elysian, whose portal we call death. It is with deep humility and with genuine pride that I assume a role in this service, for I occupy no ministerial or prolatic position. I come as a representative of the Society of American Magicians and as a humble spokesman of its members, friends of John Mooring, a compeer of the Society, who, at the call of the Supreme Magician, has slipped the bonds of flesh and gone on to take his place in the life that lies beyond. None of us can say what waits for him on the other side of the footlights as the curtain closes and the earthly plaudits die away. We only know that the veil between here and there has been lifted so that our brother may enter in and be initiated into the profound mystery of the unknown. I come to you as a representative of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. We are gathered together as family, friends, and members of this wonderful fraternity celebrating the life of John Mooring, who was also a member of the Brotherhood. John, as a member, was linked in fellowship with magicians all over the world, and his interest, activity, and skill of performing magic was enjoyed by those who were privileged to share his friendship. His accomplishments were many. 
as a performer, writer, creator, mentor, and friend to all who knew him. Let us not grieve too much, for though we do not know whether the divine spark which inhabited this body is conscious of our sense of loss, we who have faith believe that the effect now witnessed is merely the end of an act in the drama of life, and that the actor has received his cue to take a nobler part in a greater and better scene. In the name of the creator and master of all of life's mysteries, we extend our deepest sympathies to those who cherished our compere most. Let us beseech by his mystic power and his infinite love to bring strength and consolation to those who mourn. May he give them fortitude to face the mystery with faith undimmed and with hearts still lifted in prayer. We offer this time as a commemorative and a commemoration for his life and express <laughs> our sympathy to the people to whom John was close. Let us be honest. Let's not pretend that it is less than it is. It is separation. It is sorrow. It is grief. But let us neither pretend that death is more than it is. It is not annihilation. As long as memory endures, his influence will be felt. Let us be honest with death. For that honesty, we will understand John better and ourselves more deeply. So are we all born. So do we all die. Yet life and death are but words coined by man in a vain attempt to explain his coming and his going. In his infinite wisdom, the supreme magician has kept this secret from us. Why? The most learned of men cannot say, but the humblest among us feels deep within himself that the God implanted spark of divinity and immortality. One we spoke with yesterday is silent today. A friend who walked with us has gone on without us. One intrigued by mystery now knows the secret of life's greatest mystery. We shall miss him, and we shall remember him. And no greater tribute can be paid to any person than this, to say that he lives on in the hearts of his friends. When Compeer Mooring, the Texan trickster, was inducted into the Society of American Magicians, and the International Brotherhood of Magicians, he was presented with a wand, ancient emblem of mystery. It is symbolized, it symbolized the magic power that was yours, and you used your knowledge of magic secrets and your skill in their exemplification. Now its power is gone. It's a mere stick, devoid of all meaning and authority, useless without his hand to wield it. Fellow compeers, may the broken wand symbolize our submission to the mandate of the supreme magician to whom all secrets are known, even of life and death. In the surety of his love, we commit to the keeping of our brother. The magic of his performance is over. The magic and mystery that he shared will remain in our memory as commemoration of his life. No one entering this world can ever escape the sadness. Each, in turn, must bear burdens, both rich and poor, and in turn bid loved ones farewell. Each one must suffer that sad goodbye when loved ones come to that final moment that each, in turn, must face. But for those who make this life a pledge to the human spirit, there comes the assurance of a memory that made life worth living. Please take a moment to reflect upon John's life and how that he touched you. There are so many memories, so many friends, both here and abroad, some who are watching now, some who will watch later, those who were friends, acquaintances, those who knew of John. And if you'll just take some time to say hello or goodbye sometime today. It's our privilege to present this memorial for John, who was born in the world on July 19, 1942, in Houston and departed this life on July 9, 2017. 
We who are members of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and the Society of American Magicians extend to his family and loved ones our sympathy, fellowship, and gratitude for his life and companionship. He was endowed with the talent to amaze, mystify, and entertain. And may we, like John, members of this ancient theatrical art, use our skills, dexterity of hands and voice to bring happiness and awe to those for whom we conjure our pleasant and benign wonders. Let us also appreciate the beauty and wonder of life that may be hard to find within its suffering, problems, and setbacks. May John rest in peace and his memories last long with those who enjoyed his love, his talent, and his companionship. Let us pray. We cannot fathom the depths of thy mysteries nor explain the wonder of thy working. Thou hast ordained that man shall be born, live, and die. So this compere of ours, John Mooring, the Texan trickster, has fulfilled the cycle and has returned to the mystery of a world unseen. Guide him through its unfamiliar ways and grant him peace. Amen. Amen. On behalf of John's family, including Jeannie, Frank, Charles, and Cindy, we really want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming this morning, particularly the people who traveled long distances to be here. Uh, we are very thankful that we're here. The family would like to thank you for supporting John, especially in these last few difficult years. He treasured his friends and their, his connection to them, and you kept him going through that cruel disease. So thank you for that. If you'd like to remember John in a tangible way, the family's request that in lieu of flowers or remembrance be made to the Houston Area Parkinson Society, or you can donate to a charity of your choice in John's name if, if you choose to do that. For those of you that would like, uh, we're going to gather at Pappas Barbecue, which is at 4430 I-45 <coughs> North. Basically, you take I-45 just outside here north, a couple of exits to Cross Timbers, and then follow the frontage road. But if you're uncertain, stop Frank or me or somebody before you leave, and we'll make sure you can get there. It's a no-host lunch, but we'd love to see as many of you there as possible. Uh, with that, uh, we want to thank you again for coming. Uh, we know John would have loved this as a celebration. I think that might be him now. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, thank you for being here, and uh, let's, uh, let's continue the celebration at Pappas uh, in a little bit. Thank you. Mark Holstein also. Mark has done just yes. a magical job. Thank you, Mark. So that wraps us up over here. Thank you guys very much for attending uh, this this live memorial service over here for uh, for John. Uh, we haven't had a chance really to go through and to see every all the names and everything as we were paying attention really to the service. Uh, but we'll go back and take a look there later. I know the family certainly appreciates uh, you guys.